It's a great pleasure to welcome you to the 2024 Distinguished Lecture of the SOAS Food Studies Centre to, to, to be delivered by Professor Francesca Bren. My name's Lizzie Hull and I'm the Chair of the Food Studies Centre. Uh, before I introduce the speaker for, the, for this evening, allow me just to say a few words about the centre. The Food Studies Centre came into existence in 2007 it involves an interdisciplinary network of around 45 members drawn from various academic departments in SOAS. Its primary objectives include advancing research and education concerning the political, economic and cultural aspects of food. It also endeavours to facilitate connections between SOAS and external um, individuals and organisations engaged in scholarly pursuits related to food, food studies. We run a weekly seminar series and we convene workshops and conferences and we oversee a master's programme in the anthropology of food. Each year the centre in invites a prominent figure in the study of food to deliver a distinguished lecture. Previous speakers in the series include Sidney Mintz, Melissa Caldwell, James Scott, Yotam Ottolenghi, Amita Bhavaskar, Krishnendu Ray, Hannah Garth and Alex Duval among others. You can view many of these previous um, lectures on, on uh, the SOAS YouTube, YouTube playlists. Tonight's lecture will also be available on the YouTube, um, on, on, made available on YouTube, YouTube afterwards. Um, this lecture will be followed by Q&A, and then um, there is a wine reception downstairs in the cloister area, and you're all um, warmly welcome to join us there and continue the conversations and questions um, with, with a glass of wine. I hope you'll join us. I'd just like to thank a few people um, who helped to organise uh, this evening's event. I'd like to thank colleagues in the Food Studies Centre, especially Dr Jacob Klein, the Deputy Chair um, of the Centre. I'd also like to thank Charles talandier Obstel in the Centres and Institutes Office, Henty Bully from Marketing, and all of the colleagues in the catering um, team that made this evening possible. So, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce the speaker for this evening's lecture, Professor Francesca Bray. Professor Bray is an anthropologist and historian of science, technology and medicine in East Asia. She is Professor Emerita of Social Anthropology at the University of Edinburgh. Throughout her career, she's contributed profound insights into the intersections of agriculture, technology, food and society. Professor Bray's academic journey commenced with groundbreaking fieldwork on the Green Revolution in Malaysia. She completed her doctorate in, uh, in, at Cambridge University in 1985, and among her influential early publications include a contribution on agriculture to Joseph Needham's series on science and civilization in China, which was described at the time as the most comprehensive study of Chinese agriculture to be published in the West. Boring. <laughs> <laughs> Her 1986 book, The Rice Economies, Technology and Development in Asian Societies, offered a compelling critique of Eurocentric models of historical change. At the heart of this um, scholarship lay a commitment to understanding how the development of agricultural technology depended on and interacted with social dimensions, and her prize-winning book, Technology and Gender, Fabrics of Power in Late Imperial China, um, excavates this theme through connections between technology and gender making. Bray's subsequent work has been influential in showing how practices of distribution and consumption contribute to social relations and structures of power, particularly in relation to staple crops like rice. Her goody lecture titled Rice as Self, Food, History and Nation Building in Japan and Malaysia, <coughs> delivered at the Max Planck Institute for Social Anthropology, illuminates the part played by rice in defining lives, identities, and histories in regions where it's a staple crop. Her interest in rice has taken her scholarly focus beyond Asian contexts and disciplinary boundaries to investigate its rise as a global commodity and its place in the history of modern capitalism, exemplified in a co-edited book called Rice, Global Networks and New Histories, awarded the Choice Outstanding Academic Title in 2015. Mm -hmm. Her latest research that we'll be hearing about this evening um, explores the concept of cropscapes, a collaborative and experimental approach that promises to shed new light on the historical trajectories of agricultural commodities. 
So I'm very much looking forward to hearing more on this fascinating subject. Please join me in extending a warm welcome to Professor Francesca Bray. My thanks are due. If at any point you can't hear me, just tell me, because I know my voice will sink. Um, <laughs> But I, I'm loud at, in, at present in my praise and thanks to Lizzie Hall, Jacob Klein, and the SOAS Food Study Centre, with whom I've had a pleasant relationship that has taught me a great deal over, I think, now about 14 years or so. And I'm always full of admiration for the wonderful and multifaceted work that they produce and the wonderful conversations that get going. So thank you very much for inviting me and thank you to the audience for coming. My talk today explores a paradox. Can we have the first slide, please? Um, today, everybody, Chinese included, thinks of China as a civilization founded since times immemorial on rice as the essential dietary, economic, and cultural staple. Have you eaten rice today? is the way we blithely translate into English the expression Nietzsche fan la man, mistakenly presuming that the word fan, cooked grain, inevitably refers to rice. But in fact, it was millet, not rice, that was the grain that sustained the central states, the northern heartlands of Chinese culture from earliest times. Millet nourished the Chinese people and the state materially and symbolically from their earliest foundation and through a thousand years of empire molding their visions of social order and, and natural process. And then, roughly between about 750 and 1200, well, over the period from 750 to 1200, China shifted radically from a world built on millet to a world built on rice. This is not to say that farmers who had previously grown millet turned to planting rice instead. Rather, the political, economic, and cultural balance between the millet growing north and the rice growing south shifted and did so definitively. Where millet had formerly been the staple food of most of the country's population, the material mainstay of government, and one of the most potent symbols of Chinese civilization, by 1200, rice had largely displaced millet in all these roles. But I say displaced, not replaced. And the paradox is encapsulated in this image. When this painting was made in 1723, rice was overwhelmingly the most important crop and staple food and commodity in the Chinese empire, and it had been so for centuries. By now, millet was a fairly minor crop, grown mostly in poor provinces in the northwest, remote from Chinese economic highland, heartlands, and yet, when the Jesuit court artist of the Qing dynasty, Giuseppe Castiglione, sought out natural signs to celebrate the beginning of the Yongzheng Emperor's reign, along with a double lotus, which is a Buddhist symbol of purity and rebirth, he selected an auspicious form of grain, but not of rice, of millet. Now, why would this be? So, to unravel this paradox, the choice of a double-headed stem of millet as the paramount symbol of political legitimacy at a time when China's political elites never questioned rice's place as the lifeblood of the empire, the foundation of its stability and wealth. I propose to look at China's agricultural tra tra transition from empire of millet to empire of rice through the concept of the cropscape. Next slide. Okay, with my fellow crop historians, Barbara Hahn, John Lodosami, and Tiago Saraiva, we devised Cropscape as both an object and a method for studying how crops travel through space and through time. This formulation, the Cropscape, emerged from our collaboration as specialists in economic history, history of science, social history, etc. We all, did, we all had a different take on crops. And we exchanged our thoughts on particular crop histories in the context of global history, which has a remorseless emphasis on mobilities and entanglements. 
So we wanted to address not simply how crops and the systems that supported them changed as they moved from one place to another, but we wanted to pay equal attention to how they change as part of a web of communications and how they change when they stay in place as well as move from one place to another. We wanted to account not only for what did travel through space and time, but for what might be shed along the way or what new features might come to prominence. And to address such complex and evolving entanglements, we proposed the cropscape, both as a concept to encompass the constellation of elements that come together to make a specific crop, what it is in a specific place at time, and as a method or tool to analyse the movements and forces that produce or reproduce a working set of elements, as well as the capacity or the incapacity of particular crops and their assemblages to travel. So the cropscape is an assemblage formed around a crop. It's heterogeneous elements or actors who come together in a specific place and time and produce this crop as a plant, as a set of meanings, as a political factor, and as a material weight in human lives. And thus, you bring together human and non-human actors, um, and when humans seek to transplant such assemblages, they may single out different elements. They may concentrate on moving the crop species. They may be interested in a way of plowing and tilling the soil. They may think the most important thing is an institutional form that goes with a crop. They may be committed to a crop as part of a cosmology or as part of an ideology or it may be their taste, their preference. They may be fleeing a pest of a particular kind. But values and meanings are absolutely essential here, as are histories. And this is not just the histories or narratives that we tell as historians, but also how our historical subjects might be telling stories in the past about crops and what they signify and how they work. So whoever it is looking at the cropscape, whether it's us as historians or the historical, the, uh, historical actors, or even if you like a weevil, um, they will have a different point of view. Uh, uh, the same cropscape, say for example, a field of wheat, oh, no, actually make that millet, the same cropscape will look quite different to a farmer or to a locust or to a futures trader or to a tax inspector. They all have different understandings of what is there and what is at stake. And so this for us was how we conceive the, cross, the, the cropscape. It's a way of framing. So you have to look at either you, you yourself make a selection of what is important to focus on, what is important to highlight and follow, and where you draw the boundaries. Or you look at how your historical actors are doing so, and the connections that they make, and the values that they attribute, and the stories that they tell. So that's a bit abstract. Take, for example, the oft-disputed boundary between dangerous weed and valued crop. Now, in modern agronomy, the cropscape deals in black and white pretty much. So a weed is a weed, and it has to be eradicated. You can't have weeds. And that's one of the reasons that Monsanto's herbicide Roundup made the company such a huge fortune and has transformed cropscapes around the world. By contrast, in the cropscapes of the late imperial Chinese farmer, where harvest failure and famine were a continual concern, species like barnyard grass were treated judiciously. They certainly behaved weedily in rice paddies. They stole nourishment and moisture from the rice plants. That was acknowledged. But if there was a drought, the barnyard grass would provide a harvest, albeit a meager one, when the rice shriveled. So you hesitated to pull it up. Thai farmers today acknowledge the logic of Green Revolution agronomic principles, which urge farmers to apply herbicides ruthlessly to clean their fields of any competitor plants. Yet, 
They prefer, prefer to exercise their own judgment in many contexts. They often leave self-sown sports to grow undisturbed among the modern rice varieties. And they encourage hybridization with what botanists call weedy relatives as a valuable part of environmental adaptation. So in moving crops, we use the cropscape approach to investigate more closely the circumstances in which crops became weeds or weeds became crops. In other words, the constellation of factors that led to the value of a particular plant or class of plant being recoded. Let me now return to the cropscape transformations that saw rice replace millet as China's iconic food foodstuff and crop in some circumstances, but not all. So, of course, this cropscape approach wasn't an abstract exercise that we conjured out of the air. It was a product of our own shared experience as historians of agriculture, trying each from our own angles, regions, special favorite things, to make better sense of changes and trends and what they signified and involved for the people on the ground and for us as analysts of the past or the present. The contrast between northern China's millet civilization and southern China's rice-based one and their historical significance was something I had to grapple with from the moment I began working on the agricultural volume for Joseph Needham's Science and Civilization project, which was, I hate to say, about 50 years ago. <laughs> so you see this is a mature project. Um, as soon as I was given my first Chinese agricultural text to translate, I said, oh my god, this, <laughs> what is this about? It's about this thing. What is, it? what is it? What is it? It's millet. Everything here is about millet. What is going on? It was a text from the 6th century, and therefore it was about millet. Um, this was when I first realized that millet was important. And I started paying attention to the fact that the Chinese saw North and South as fundamentally different because of their contrasting agricultural systems. And this difference was encapsulated in two distinct terms for cultivated land. So the dry land fields of the North are called, are called um, Ti, and the irrigated fields of the South are called Tian. And this, you know, you have to know that there is a difference between these. Um, it's not something that you're taught in language class, mm -hmm. but it's something which I don't know if Chinese today would realize the difference, but even 50 years ago, Chinese would know immediately whether you were talking about North or South, depending on which term you used. So I first addressed the contrast between these cropscapes, because I was working for the Needham volume, in agronomic terms. So how did crops, farming techniques, and systems differ and the differences were reported in a voluminous technical literature produced over many dynasties. Later, I started thinking about this in terms of modes of production and their historical dynamics. And then I turned to the perspective of gender and state building, linking the... Does anybody else want to sit down? Because there are a few seats. We can have a, we can have a seat for us. Everybody sitting comfortably, then I'll begin. <laughs> um, yeah, so where well, I got to gender. Um, gender and state building, and you'll hear later why I thought these related to agriculture. Linking the gendered and the political cropscapes to what one could call an overarching cosmic moral cropscape. And latterly, when we were well into our moving crops project, I was piqued and intrigued by something I just learned about, and that was the current fortunes of millet farming in China, which has been rescued from the brink of extinction as a health food, a heritage food, something grown by peasants and celebrated as such, 
rich with proteins and rich with environmental promise for a hard future. And I'm not going to talk about that now, but what I ask myself, can Millet's 21st century, 21st century revival tell us about the long history of the crop and the different values that have been attached to it over the centuries and in different, by different people, dietary, economic, <coughs> cultural, political. And that got me thinking afresh about the earlier mobilities of China's millet cropscape and its different elements, its material and its symbolic elements. So, as I say, I'm not going to talk about this fascinating revival now, though it is fascinating for anybody interested in contemporary food studies. And I do have a slide for the very end with some publications and about some research publications on it, if anybody is interested, that we can show. Um, however, now, instead, I'm going to take as the pivot of my discussion the Castiglione painting. Oh, sorry, the previous oh. slide, of, <laughs> of the lovely vase of peonies and millet. And his choice of double panicled millet as a symbol of imperial legitimacy. So first I'm going to bore you with the material cropscapes of millet and rice because I really love technical details. <laughs> and I'm going to give you a thumbnail sketch of how the balance between them played out historically. And then I'm going to turn to the corresponding moral cropscapes to reflect upon the symbolic afterlife of millet when it was no longer materially such a major crop. So I'll start by talking a bit about material cropscapes. Next slide, please. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, um, so there you have, this is an archaeological illustration, so it, it goes back to, I don't know, 3000 BC or something like that. But, um, but it's actually not all that different now. You have here, this is dry land agriculture. Today it would be uh, mostly meat, uh, mostly wheat, some millets, uh, corn, if necessary. Um, and this is the rice agriculture area, and the Canton area, Hongzhou area, is tropical agriculture, also growing rice today. Um, but you see here is the Yellow River, the Yellow River Basin. Here is the Yangtze. This was where China had its capital whenever possible, these northern areas. First, here and here, and then further up in Beijing, starting in the Ming Dynasty. But basically, you, the, all the early capitals of United China were along the Yellow River. Um, and this was the area which, by about 800, was generating most of the wealth. And this became the area which was uh, the area where the best silk was produced, uh, the most cotton was woven, the most trade went on, and it was the commercial material center of China, sharing that with the southern ports of Guangzhou and so on. Just to give you a vague outline of this difference between north and south, which started in Neolithic times and has persisted to the present day. So rice replaced millet, starting in around, probably around 700, 600, um, and steadily became the major staple, the major source, not just of food, but of state revenues, because taxes were collected in kind. So each peasant household had to pay tax in grain and textiles. And that was what you paid your officials with, you paid the army with, you fed the army, you paid them. Uh, you kept the court going. Uh, this was absolutely essential. It was only changed to a uh, monetary tax system starting in about 1100 and a full change by 1600. But all the way up to 1600, there were still taxes being paid in grain. Anyway. Um, there are immense differences in climate and soil, as well as just in the color of the spots on the map. Um, and there were, uh, in consequence, there were 
contrasting logics of technical style. And this meant that the two farming systems from the different northern and southern regions remained distinct over the centuries. It wasn't a question of replacing millet with rice because the physical cropscapes were not interchangeable. A wet field is not good for millet and a dry field is not good for rice. And if you don't have any rain, you can't irrigate a field. So it was a God-given natural difference. Um, both areas of China had equal potential to become China's heart, early heartland. Sorry, that's my phone. Um, it, both areas domesticated grains about 8,000 years ago, millets in, mostly in the north and rice mostly in the south. Um, but for complicated reasons, it was the north that came to dominate culturally and politically. Between around 1600 and 500 before Christ, excuse the old-fashioned nomenclature, um, the capital cities of the legendary three dynasties and the historic dynasties were all located in the central states, Guangzhou, at sites along the Yellow River Basin. And during the Warring States period, from around 500 to the foundation of the first unified empire by the famous Emperor of Qin, in 221 BC, him of, he of the standing warrior army. Um, until that period, it might have tipped towards the south. There was a rice-based state <coughs> of Chu, which spread out from this region in Hunan, right the way to the coast, and conquered everything, almost up to Shandong. And then there was an almighty battle in 222, and the Qin won. So China became a northern civilization. <coughs> and Qin was a state centered in the arid northwest, in the high low lands, which are perfect millet territory. And it had woven for several centuries, not only a perfected art of millet farming that was foundational to their <coughs> uh, philosophy of political economy, but also very importantly, a perfected art of millet-based taxation and resource management, which made them invincible. So this was when the Yellow River Basin and its millet farming system were entrenched as the tax base of what was now an empire, a region stretching all through North and South. And Millet was the food not only of peasants, but of the imperial court and of the vast armies that regimes had to deploy along the very vulnerable open frontiers of the northern provinces, where <clears throat> barbarian nom nomadic hordes, as we used to call them in the un <laughs> unreconstructed old days, <laughs> would come for again. Um, and they did this repeatedly. Um, so millet was the most important grain. It was the most important food because most of the population was then in northern China. I didn't want to overwhelm you with slides, but there's a very interesting reversal where up to 800 thousands of dots of population in the north and just a few scattered ones in the south. And then by 1100, thousands of dots of population in the <laughs> south and more scattered ones in the north. Definitely a complete change. However, when the millet, fund, the millet economy was at its height and the tax system was going great guns in the north, there is, for example, the Hanjia tax granary, which was built in 605 in the capital city of Luoyang, which was in the heartland of millet territory on a tributary of the Yellow River. And this granary <coughs> held up to 6 million bushels, which is approximately 600,000 cubic meters, which I believe is probably about 600,000 tons of millet, contained in 300 huge lime-lined pits. And the great thing about millet was that, at least in a dry climate, it will store for ages. You can keep it for 10 years, 12 years. It'd be OK. 
wheat, the weevils get in. Rice goes rotten. Uh, you have to be very careful with these other crops. But millet, oh, just, you know, put it in a pit, go away, forget about it, come back. You plant a tree on top of it, and when the tree, <laughs> when the tree's 20 feet high, you say, oh, get the millet out now. <laughs> and nobody will, no, none of your barbarian hordes of horsemen will have noticed it, because who would think to look under a tree for a, a pot of millet? However, even in around 600, CE, the millet rice balance was tipping, and one of the reasons was because of migration from north to south, because of these said bar barbarians. And another, <laughs> of course, was the, the word got out that rice farming produced large amounts of grain compared to millet. Um, so rice had an unmatched ability to sustain dense populations, and when the north got overcrowded, which it often did, uh, either the state would say, well, why don't you go south and seek a fortune, or people would just move on their own initiative. So gradually, populations started pouring south. And in 605, the same year that the Hanja granary was built, um, the Grand Canal was completed linking the southern Yangtze Basin, uh, Yangtze Delta, to the north and the northern capitals so that you could easily trans, um, transport grain north, sorry, transport the grain uh, from the south to the north so that actually at this point rice did, even though it didn't keep well, it became part of the state's redistribution and payment system for maintaining its institutions and paying its personnel. So, um, in, the, in the Song Dynasty, which was a beautiful, flourishing dynasty, the northern barbarians poured in again. Well, actually, by that stage, they'd become a northern dynasty with a very sophisticated culture and uh, uh, actually the pioneers of the printing of great collections of canonical works. However, they were barbarians by Sung standards, and they took over the Sung, they captured the northern capital in 1126, and the Sung dynasty had to flee south and set up capital, its new capital in what is today Hangzhou. And they lost all their millet lands to this northern kingdom of nomads. So they lost the millet region, and they suddenly had to start to pay serious attention to how the rice was grown, which they had happily received off the barges coming up the Grand Canal. Where did this stuff come from? What was going on here? But they did know that it was good pickings, and so they didn't abandon hope, and they turned their attention to rice with enthusiasm. And I'll come back to that in a few minutes. Can I have the next slide, please? So what am I talking about here? You all know what rice looks like, so I don't have to show you that. Um, the, the one on the left is Ceteria millet. It's foxtail millet. Um, and the one on the right is barnyard millet, panicum millet. And millet's a tricky term because it basically refers not to close relatives, but to grains, to, to cereals with small grains. So there's many, many different kinds of grain that are called millet. But these are the ones that were important in China. And why were they so favored? Well, North China is not an easy place to farm. It has intensely cold winters and burning hot summers. And there's not much rain. And it tends to fall all in the summer, often as violent thunderstorms. So it's a difficult place to farm. and. The soils in the area, the, the less soils, the yellow soils of the upper, yeah, upper Yellow River are fertile, but they're very fragile. They erode easily. And the soils of the lower Yellow River plains are stiff, prone to waterlogging, difficult to work. But over the course of millennia, northern farmers perfected not just these crops, but also techniques to manage these extremes. And after their domestication around 6000 BC, um, along with various beans, the ways of 
of growing these crops were perfected so that they became really quite reliable. Next slide, please. So here you have a charming picture of the tomb of some aristocrat in northwest China um, of the kinds of techniques that would have produced the grain which formed his wealth and his sustenance. Um, the principles of this distinctive millet-based cropping system are set out in great detail in a magisterial farming treatise from about 540, the Qimin Yashu, Essential Techniques for the Common People, by Jia Sixie, who was an official of the Northern Wei Dynasty, and he ran a large manorial farm himself, so he describes everything that goes on there. And this is, the, this is the work that nearly caused me to faint when I was first told, translate this. <laughs> first of all, it's very big. And secondly, it was about something I didn't know anything about. Um, anyway, all the details are there. It's a wonderful work. It includes recipes, if anybody's interested. <laughs> Not TikTok, but uh, good recipes. Um, However, it was actually a, a lot of the main points about how to grow things were set down in writing at least 800 years before Jia wrote. Um, in particular, some of these farming principles were collected in a very influential political treatise, the Spring and Autumn Annals of Master Lu, which quotes from a still earlier work, which has since been lost, called the Book of Prince Millet. And this system was based on very intensive tilling operations. And they were designed to retain scarce moisture in the soil so that throughout these dry seasons, the crop would continue to grow and the, crop would, uh, and the soil would be sufficiently well worked not to turn into a muddy stream when the rains arrived. So you have a system of planting in rows, and you make the, ho the rows either with hoes, or you make them with a plow, and you do strip and lynch it, and you get these long, long rows. And then you take your seed drill. Uh, there's not a picture of a seed drill there, but there are other pictures of people using seed drills in this early time. And you go along the rows with the seed drill, dropping just one or two grains every foot or so. And then the plants start to grow, and then you weed, and you weed, and you hoe, and you hoe, and you weed, and you weed, and you, weed. you make sure that it's almost Monsanto-like. You try to make sure that nothing is competing for the moisture that these plants need. Now, some of this could be done by the peasant. And there were lots of peasants in China at different times. And every new dynasty would say, we'd be very nasty to the peasants. We must distribute land to them. We will revive the equal field system and everybody will get land to grow millet and land to grow hemp for textiles. And this land will be redistributed every generation. It's obviously a very complicated system to run. And so what happens, um, powerful people say, oh, don't worry about that. We'll just have a manor. <laughs> so much simpler. But we won't pay any taxes because we're doing the work for you. So there was this constant, uh, this constant tension between a state that depended on peasants for the tax grains to survive and a much more productive system that could grow multiple crops on bigger areas with lots of animals and lots of implements and lots of labor and that could do crop rotations because it had plenty of land. So this was the system described in the essential techniques is just beautiful, but a peasant alone couldn't do it. So you have this tension between what is the most productive for the state, which is peasants, and what is most productive in terms of output, and that is the manorial system. In other words, it's a kind of historical yo-yo, new dynasty, redistribution of land, suppression of landlords, but you can't keep a good landlord down. And um, it was a precarious balance. And so when rice came on the scene, it was actually a much more stable system. Can we have the next slide, please? Um, 
So socially and politically, the rice cropscape that evolved in the south was much more stable because once you'd got your viable irrigated units in place, um, they're very productive, but they're productive at a small scale. And so small peasant farmers could run a small farm and produce as much pro rata as a large farm. So there were landlords, but they didn't farm themselves. They let the land out to tenants. And this was recognized as being equally productive with larger units. There wasn't the same conflict of interest between landlords, peasant, and state. So from that perspective, this was a system which was a good, stable basis for the huge economic growth that started to take place then. Interestingly, though, it had taken Chinese elites a very, very long time to get a grip on the specifics of the southern cropscape. They were ignorant of the work involved in intensive rice farming, which had been going on for centuries in the south. But they were all too familiar with the hard labor needed to wrest a good crop of millet from the soil. So these medieval northerners, who were the political elite, spoke enviously of the south. They called it the lands of fish and rice. It was a region of natural bounty, where grains and other foods could be harvested plentifully and almost without effort, they believed, by indolent southern barbarians. So they didn't pay much attention to what was going on. And it was certainly true that southern farmers needed to farm less land for the same amount of food. So in around 600, 700, it was reckoned that about 100 mu, which is six hectares of millet fields, hardly a Midwestern farm, but still quite a lot of land, was needed to support an adult male peasant and his family. But wet rice farming could support much higher densities of population. And certainly by the 1600s, uh, experts reckoned that half a hectare of paddy land was enough to support a family. And land landowners should, re should rent out any more that they had to careful tenants, because careful tenants were what you needed. The careful tenant knows how to manage water and how to apply labor sensibly. So the big thing in the South was getting the water supply into place. And carving out paddies was certainly a big undertaking, yet the area grew continuously. As long ago as two millennia, a previous, uh, uh, sorry, two, two millennia ago, that is to say, in zero, southern kingdoms were already building irrigation schemes. And in imperial times, infants were named after good officials who carried out drainage works or land reclamation schemes. So you'd get a lot of little kids called Chengda because Fan Chengda had built a seawall. And at least this is what the records tell us. I don't know how many children were actually called Chengda, but it makes a good story. Um, and so, you know, officials and the state were deeply involved. Landlords would do it. They would commandeer their, their labor. Uh, clans and lineages were huge expanders of irrigated land because they would acquire land by fair meal means or foul. They would set their poorer members to work turning this communal asset into paddies, and then the communal asset was distributed as farmland among the different members of the lineage. So with all this infrastructural investment, material and social, paddies became a very permanent feature of the landscape. Once you had a, paddy, a patch of paddy land, you did not abandon it. And good farmers run their land with meticulous care, and they work just as intensively as the best northern farmers. But the principles were very different from keeping a dust mulch going. You had to control the water. You had to bring the water into the fields. You had to drain it when the plants wanted to have dry feet. You needed, you needed to coordinate with your neighbors because the water would be coming from a communal source. You needed to coordinate with your neighbors for working the, the drainage pumps. And the reward for this was that you got a good harvest. It meant that the fields had to be very small because the water has to be absolutely level. And so you could have individual fields in an irrigation unit which would be at slightly different levels, but within a field, the water must always be level right the way through. 
And round the fields, you would have the buns, and you would have higher land, anything that wasn't flat. And on that land, you would grow all kinds of other crops, notably mulberry trees for silk, or oranges, or tea up in the hills, or bamboo. And you had the labor available to grow these crops, except at the times of transplanting and harvesting, when everybody had to be in the fields at the same time. So it was a system that meshed quite well with manufacturing, home manufacturing. So the interesting thing is that this was already a very sophisticated system in, say, 800. But it was only given focused attention by Chinese elites with the fall of the Song in 1126 when they lost the north. And now they had to take what was their, had become their only source of sustenance very seriously. And two foundational works on rice farming appeared within 20 years of the loss of the north. One was called Plowing and Sericulture Illustrated, and another one was called An Agricultural Treatise by a man named Chen Fu. And the Plowing and Sericulture Illustrated is a lovely work. I'll show you some bits in a minute. Um, and making up for lost time, it illustrates and describes in meticulous detail 21 steps of rice farming. And Chen Fu's treatise provides equally detailed tech, uh, technical instructions, but all in text, prose. And the interesting thing is that he dismisses as rubbish everything that has been written earlier on rice. He says, they were northerners. What did they know? And he was right. Next, next slide, please. So, not just a change of crop, there was another change in these new cropscapes and their coding, which is that uh, these Sung works, these Sung, from the Sung period on, we start seeing women's work, textile work, being presented as integral to agriculture. So it's not just there is farming and then in the, in the houses there is textile production. It's the farm is the man's work and the woman's work. Um, this had always been recognized in the taxation system, but it wasn't recognized in the agricultural treatises, and now it becomes central. So um, the illustrations of plowing and weaving, the very title gives the tone. Its author, Lo Shu, who was the magistrate of a county just outside the new capital in Hangzhou, gives equal weight to men's and women's work. And his nephew said, for, every fa for, for farming he depicts every step from soaking the seeds to storing the grain in the granary, 21 steps in all. For sericulture, there are 24 steps from washing the silkworm eggs to tailoring the cloth. And as I say, it had always been a, a kind of political economic tenet that men's and women's work was equally important, which is kind of interesting when you think that uh, the reformers of 1900 were saying, oh, I've got to do something about Chinese women. They're, they're, they're useless, enslaved at home, and they contribute nothing to the economy. And, um, and 200 years earlier, officials had been saying, ah, the women are working very hard, but not at the right thing. We need to work, make, get them to work at other things so that they can really develop the local economy. So a real change of heart, you know, in the modern cropscape. Anyway, the, the Sung, Sung works gave iconic status to this pairing of, in this case, rice and silk that was typical of the Hangzhou region. But you find it carried on later with people saying, well, you know, in the north they're growing wheat and cotton, so we need to do beautiful pictures of people growing wheat and cotton. It becomes a genre. And, um, yeah, I think the pictures, the pictures are just beautiful because they're shown as pictures of everyday life. They were intended not so much as technical landscapes, though the technical descriptions were there, but as moral landscapes. And, the nephew of the author of the illustrations wrote, he was genuinely concerned with common people's lives. 
He felt deep sympathy for the hard toil of farmers and women weavers, and he investigated every aspect of their tasks for his series of pictures. Now, as I say, theoretically, this importance and even this sympathy for the toiling farmer and for the toiling farmer's wife dated far back. But it was mostly expressed at a very general level. So it was the obligation of the ruler and his officials to ensure the welfare of the people. That was the task of the state. And as a means to that end, to encourage agriculture, chuanong, by providing instruction in advanced cultivation methods, by investing in public works, or offering loans or tax relief in times of hardship. But the close-up view that Lo Shu gives us of peasant families toiling and sweating to provide the goods that kept society afloat was novel, and it was wildly successful. It rang a deep chord at every level of society. It was praised by the emperor, who immediately had the work engraved and circulated widely, and members of the elite were charmed by the poems which they learnt by heart, and according to Lo Shu's relatives, they would recite them to each other at drinking parties. Um, serious guys, these Confucians. <laughs> but ordinary people were enchanted too. They quickly appropriated these charming images and they circulated widely in cheap wood blocks or as motifs printed, painted on pottery or on fans, or as in this right-hand version, this is from a popular encyclopedia, and it shows the, uh, the trays of silkworms in their second sleep, and um, the women are tending to the silkworms, but they're also tending to the family. So it was a beautiful combination of family values and economic assiduity. So the illustrations of farming and sericulture imprinted on the southern rice scape an image of hard work, perseverance, thrift, social responsibility, all the long-standing virtues of the Confucian elites, but they were now being equally attributed to commoners. And not coincidentally, this time, around 1100, was exactly the time when the old aristocratic elite had been replaced by an educated meritocracy. So the exam system was what got you to the top, not who your uncle was. These Neo-Confucians cherished the belief that even a plowboy could make it to Grand Secretary. This was a trope. And in fact, some plowboys did make it to Grand Secretary. And that morals should be shared across all classes of society, and that proper behavior on the part of the common people was just as crucial to maintaining the cosmic harmony that ensured peace as was that of gentlemen. So in illustrating a complementarity between male and female duties here in the sphere of work, the, Gangju, the illustrations of plowing and weaving were showing a, co a cosmic complementarity between yin and yang, between male and female, which was considered absolutely fundamental to the harmony of the cosmic order that ensured the continu continuity of the state. So that there was all this significance in a bowl of rice and a skein of yarn. However, a bowl of millet carried no less moral freight or significance. According to Chinese legend, it was Lord Millet, a magical being conceived when his mother stepped in a footprint left in the soil by the supreme deity, who taught the ancient Chinese how to grow grain, and these grains were millets. So according to the poem Shengmen, giving birth to the people, in the Book of Songs, which is a work supposedly de dating back to before, ten, uh, to before 1000 BC, and edited by Confucius himself, According to this poem, Lord Millet gave the Ur Chinese, quotes, the five cereals, black millet, double kerneled black millet, millet with red sprouts, millet with white sprouts, and on and on and on. So these millets included varieties for eating, the varieties for brewing wine, and Lord Millet thus created the sacrifices of grain, wine, and meats that were the ritual core of the ancestral cult as practiced by the royal house 
and by its aristocratic kin and allies. The poem goes on, Lord Millet founded the sacrifices and without blemish or flaw they have been continued until now. So Lord Millet was a, a wonderful legendary character and he was supposedly the founding ancestor of the royal lineage of the Zhou dynasty. And the Zhou dynasty was remembered as China's golden age of institutional purity and basically um, everything you could revive from the Zhou, you should. So during their reign, which started in around 1000 BC, this was the era that laid the foundation of Chinese philosophy and statecraft. The era, the era which produced these great canons which Confucius edited and passed on. Um, of course, it turns out that this is all a bit legendary, but uh, there were, <laughs> they were mostly works written retrospectively and in the first empire, probably, you know, 100 BC, 100 AD, and then passed on as being, oh, Confucius edited them and we found them on a piece of stone in a mountain. Um, but anyway, the, the Zhou dynasty was the important. And just like the study of the canonical works of this period, the continuity of Zhou sacrificial rituals was considered essential right through imperial times to preserving a harmonious world order. And in particular, to the legitimacy of the dynasty in power. Correct performance of these sacrifices enacted the current ruler's link to the original Zhou dynasty, confirming his moral legitimacy to rule the empire. Next slide. Oh God, I'm so sorry. I'll hurry up. Um, so the sacrifices of grain, wine, and meat took place in an ancestral temple, and they depended on agricultural success. And this was ensured by the royal rituals performed twice yearly at the altar of soil and millet. And these rituals were a primary symbol of state creation. All states had to have an altar of soil of millet. It was the ritual symbolic center of the realm, and its safety was synonymous with that of the state. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the temple of soil and millet, built in 1421 by the Ming dynasty Yongle emperor, still stands in Beijing today, and is still a place accorded much respect, even by the communist government. So according to the Book of Rituals, the Son of Heaven personally plows the ground for the grains with which to fill the vessels and the black millet from which to distill the fragrant sacrificial wine for the services to the supreme deity. And note, it was millet, not rice. And right into the 17th and 18th centuries, even though millet was by now a minor crop on the national scale of importance, one or two counties in the arid northwest that produced particularly fine millet were required to send millet to the imperial court as tribute. So there are many other cultural fa facets of the early milletscape that we could discuss which contributed to millet's aura and you will be happy to, say, to, to know that I'm going to skip those bits uh, in the interest of time. Um, but they include things like metrics, which were very, very important because metrics are part of cosmic harmony and you measure everything in the length of millet grains. Um, so engaging the import of all these cultural and cosmic associations of millet as grain, we need to bear in mind that the classical tradition formed during the Zhou dynasty and the early empire was as familiar in China at the height of the empire and indeed at its fall in 1911, as the Bible, Homer and Cicero were in Britain across the same period. New learning and interpretations were continually added to the portfolio of canonical wisdom and values, but while the old might sometimes fade, it didn't disappear and regular renaissances occurred when ancient knowledge was revived and celebrated afresh. Next slide, please. So, returning now to the Yongzheng Emperor, who had been just a year on the throne, the test year, when this painting 
was made. This was a sign that in his first year, he had attracted the favor of heaven. And this was especially important because the Qing rulers were not Chinese, they were Manchus, and they were proud of this. Nevertheless, they were determined to show themselves legitimate rulers of their Han dominion. So when they overthrew the Ming dynasty in 1644, they immediately set out to prove themselves wise and capable sovereigns in the best Confucian tradition, despite or even because it was foreign to their own heritage. Working with officials to encourage agriculture, Qianong was a prominent concern of the Qing emperors, and we have many fine examples of that. But here, as in other domains of social organization, the Qing rulers judged symbolic action as important as material interventions. The emperors who immediately preceded and succeeded the Yongzheng emperor, the Kangxi and the Qianlong emperors, both commissioned new editions of the illustrations of, of the illustrations of plowing and weaving that I showed you earlier, and they circulated these new editions in woodblock prints around the empire, and had them carved on stone in all the places, and they wrote new sets of poems themselves to accompany the images, um, not all of which are judged to be poetically very wonderful, but it's the thought that counts. Um, and so legitimacy for these Qing emperors through working for the welfare of the people was a constant concern. And it was particularly so for their ruling house because they were considered prima facie as alien usurpers by the majority of the population. They had to win the trust of the people. And reissuing, plowing and weaving illustrated moralized a moral cropscape and moral leadership to this end. But it was also crucial to de demonstrate another form of legitimacy, and that was ritual descent from the founding ancestors. And as you can imagine, this is a particular challenge for non-Chinese claimants of the imperial throne. Because you can't just say, oh, you know, my it was the second cousin twice removed. No, you have no bloodline. So here, the altar of soil and grain and the ritual offerings of millet and millet wine were the essential medium for claiming that affinity. And viewed in this light, it's no surprise that it was panicles of millet, not of rice, that were chosen to demonstrate heavenly approval of the enthronement of a new emperor. I think Confucius would have approved. Thank you.